The Perfect Host premiered at Sundance Film Festival in 2010, and this stars uh, David Hyde Pierce. David Hyde Pierce, who is pretty much famous for being in Frasier. He played a um, psychiatrist in that show for pretty much its entire runtime. Uh, was never the big Frasier, biggest Frasier fan, so I haven't really seen the series or anything like that, but uh, that's where he's most notably from. He also did a voice in, the Bugs, in A Bug's Life, I'm pretty sure. Um, as well as Osmosis Jones, from what I've read from his Wikipedia. Anyways, he stars in it as well as Clayne Crawford as a career criminal. And uh, I'm going to be giving the basic gist of this film to start. For anybody who hasn't seen it, I won't be spoiling it at the beginning. Uh, basically, this is about a man played by um, Clayne Crawford who recently just robbed a bank and he's basically on the escape and uh, everybody is kind of chasing after him and his name is all over the radio and and television and uh, he's trying desperately to hide out <clears throat> and he finds his way into this man's home uh, named David Hyde Pierce and he kind of cons his way in there um, to hide out from everything and this guy's throwing a dinner party he seems to be pretty well off financially and uh, very like mild-mannered well-spoken guy and uh, basically it just takes a whole 180 and um, the villain, who you think is um, going to be the villain, turns into the uh, guy held hostage, pretty much. And the guy who you think is the innocent, well-mannered guy, the main guy, turns into a little bit of a psychopath. And then the film plays out from there. It goes batshit insane. It's mostly a black comedy. Um, there's a lot of comedic moments. It's, eh, I wouldn't say dramatic, but it's, there's some thrills in it. There's a lot of, like anxious moments, anxiety, and then the last 20 minutes kind of actually turns into a detective kind of uh, uh, story. Like, it definitely takes a little bit of a, a turn in mood and theme and um, what the rest of the film was. So you kind of almost feel like you're watching a different movie, but um, that's basically how it ends off. It, uh, it, it turns into a little bit of a chase. But, um, yeah, so that's basically the mild gist of it. Um... I'm getting into spoilers now. Uh, I don't know... I really don't know what the budget on this film was. It's definitely an indie film, uh, hands down. And there are some moments in it that, for lack of a better word, uh, feel a little cheap, I guess. But it, that's also kind of a strong word because cheap is not really the word I'm looking for. just seems um, like there was a budget restraint and... Um, like, I don't know, some of the cinematography just doesn't seem um, that high caliber uh, in certain scenes, especially in the beginning. As, as you start to get to the middle, like the, the once the film starts to really take off in its uh, plot and its themes, it starts to pick up and it starts to get a lot better, certainly a lot funnier. Um, and I'm telling you, David Hyde Pierce... Um, his performance in this film is uh, is a treat. Honestly, it's the the film is automatically worth watching uh, just because of his performance alone. Um, in the end, I landed on a two and a half out of five because it is one of those films that I loved certain aspects of it and wasn't the biggest fan of other aspects of it, mainly to do with the plot. And uh, that's basically what I give two and a half. When I give two and a half scores, it's usually because of that. I loved certain things. I wasn't the biggest fan of other things. But anyways, um, so Clayne Crawford is running from... He, he basically just finished his robbery. He gets into a convenience store. There's this kind of hilarity ensues scene in the in the convenience store. You got the uh, Asian worker. It automatically gets robbed by somebody else conveniently while Clayne Crawford's character, John, his name is uh, John uh, John Taylor. And he's buying medication for his foot because he think he got shot on in it or he somehow he slashed his foot or something. So he's limping the whole time. And the convenience store conveniently gets robbed by somebody else who has like a now Elliot Page, but had like an Ellen Page voice. If, if anybody has seen Hard Candy, basically it's like Ellen Page from Hard Candy or Elliot Page now who was Ellen Page in Hard Candy. Uh, robbing this convenience store. It's really funny because she's short and everything and she's like got like a, 
like a, a cap and she's like trying to act all tough but she's so like small and skinny <laughs> and she's robbing a convenience store acting like she's the toughest girl in the world it's kind of funny um but yeah and then that whole robbery ends up you know he try he, the main guy takes her gun and points it back at her and then he gets out of there and he's looking for a place to stay he knocks on this woman's door who he saw a Jehovah's Witness sign outside of, and he's trying to be all polite and nice, even though you can kind of read around him and he is acting pretty sketchy in this scene. Um, he's like, yeah, I saw your Jehovah's Witness sign and I understand how this must look, but uh, you know, I just thought you could possibly uh, <laughs> help me out a little bit. And she's like, oh, you're a Jehovah, huh? But how come you're not wearing your cross? And he's like, oh, when I got mugged, they, they yanked it off of me. And the lady's like, well, hopefully you'll get one next Christmas. And he puts his foot on the door and she like looks at him weird and, and she he's like, please, like I'm really desperate right now. I mean no harm and stuff like that. And she's like, well, you're if, if you're a Jehovah's, you know uh, that we don't celebrate Christmas or celebrate the cross, wolf. <laughs> Calls him a wolf and just like slams the door on him. So she was a very smart lady. I really appreciated her wit and I really appreciated her uh, test on him. So... I like that a lot. Um, and then he ends up at Buddy's house. Uh, his name is Warwick, the the David Hyde Pierce character. His name is Warwick. And he, like I said, is a very like mild-mannered, kind of uh, polite person. Pretty flamboyant. Uh, he has a really weird walk. Like, he almost walks like a penguin, but he does this, like, arm thing every time he walks anywhere. And he's always, like, swaying back and forth. It's really funny. He really gave his character... Um, a personality and uh like he really created his character a lot which i always appreciate from any actor and I like when a an actor dives into a character and kind of really makes the character much different than than the actor is themselves but uh like i said a lot of anxiety induced scenes when um when john is at this man warwick's house because uh he finds a postcard by this woman named Julia in the mailbox, and this is what he uses to bribe himself and con himself into the home, is this postcard from this woman named Julia from Australia, and he pretends to know Julia. He pretends, he tells Warwick that he just flew back from Australia and that he met Julie and that they became friends and that Julia mentioned Warwick to him. And, you know, if he's ever in L.A., where this Los Angeles, where this... Uh, film takes place that he should contact Warwick and whatnot so he develops this whole exuberant story um and Warwick is insisting on you know calling the airport because he mentions mentions his luggage gone missing and he mentions he want he needs to stay at his cousin's but his cousin isn't home so he has to stay here for the time being yada yada and Warwick is trying to call the airport and at uh, one point Warwick tries to call Julia where the phone doesn't go through so he just gets Julia's answering machine so uh John is is safe for for that point in time and you see John like he'll go to the wall where there's a rack of uh swords like katanas and a bunch of knives and stuff and and it's just the tension between the two characters because you know something is going to you know, go Ari, you just don't know exactly <laughs> how both characters are gonna, or especially the main one, is gonna totally switch gears on, uh, on John. And the threats that John makes to, to Warwick as well, like, he threatens him at knife point, which is really disturbing, and, uh, basically tells him to just, you know, stay back, and there isn't even a point where he says, like, to Warwick he's like I'm gonna kill you I've already made that decision so you already like feel the tension but he's like but if you stay out of my way and just stick to yourself and keep your dumbass opinions to yourself until morning I might change my mind and uh and yeah and then uh this is after the broadcast on the radio comes up and this is where Warwick hears the radio and then his his cover is exposed uh John's um, and then once, uh, he basically takes the wine bottle and starts to chug it and, and chill out while he's, you know, basically holding Warwick hostage. And then he passes out because Warwick was smart enough to drug the wine. 
and when John comes to, we have all the hilarity and all the black comedy going on. So uh, John is t uh, tied to a chair, which you have to suspend your disbelief because the chair that uh, John is tied to, he's has his hands behind his back. He could like literally just stand up. If he stood up, he'd just come right up from the chair. It's not like uh, it's not like his hands were tied around a bar or something on the chair. It's just a regular rectangular chair that his hands are tied behind. So very very easy and effortless escape. But that's a nitpick kind of it, those things you notice they're, they're definitely noticeable but it's there it's just one of those things you just got to skip and forget about and you know continue with the <laughs> with the point of the movie um but he's tied to the chair and uh the whole time warwick is talking to invisible people so this guy is uh i'm, I'm assuming a schizophrenic he definitely uh talks to people who are not there, many of them, and he has a whole dinner party where he serves actually a really delicious looking duck dinner um, and just has full conversations with invisible people. It's really hilarious. And John is stuck there tied up <laughs> while uh, Warwick is, you know, having a conversation with everybody else and talking with uh, John at the same time. And it's just, it's really funny to watch this performance of David Hyde Pierce play this psychotic, <laughs> delusional dude. And he has pictures around his house too. And he's like this with nobody there. And this is where John is like, the fuck is wrong with this guy? And uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, there's a point where one of the delusion, like one of the fake women that he knows, one of his fake friends, uh, at one point, John, like, gets out of his rope and bumps into the chair and knocks the chair over. And he's running, trying to help this, like, imaginary lady. And he's, like, holding her and, like, putting her back on the chair and trying to, like, fix her face and stuff like that. And he's like, are you going to apologize to Chelsea? <laughs> Once he knocks him out again and ties him back up, back up to the chair. And uh, John is like, because he crawls over the table and puts a knife at John's neck. And uh, it's really creepy, like, that shot alone, the way he's crawling over the table is really creepy. And then John's like, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. <laughs> because he literally doesn't see her there. She's imaginary. Uh, Warwick brings out a scrapbook at one point, and this is where you realize that he legitimately is a serial killer. And he, it's his passion project. He brings people over and murders them after throwing fake dinner parties with imaginary people. And he really takes these imaginary people seriously. Like, he does a really good job pretending they're literally there. It's like he's talking to a person, except he's just talking to a wall. <laughs> it's really, really funny to watch. I mean, the whole, like, seriousness of the mental illness is real, but, uh, but the way they portray it in this movie as a piece of fiction and the way they make his character so crazy <laughs> is... Uh, it's funny. It's it's really awesome to see. There's a a scene where apparently Warwick made a Super 8 film of himself and he plays it for John and it's hilarious because John's on a chair and he gets one of his imaginary friends to be like, come over here, help me with John. And he goes on one end of John's chair while the imaginary dude is on the other. And he's like, one, two, three, and he lifts, and John just falls sideways because there's nobody on that side. And then he just drags the chair with John tied to it, and John's uh, face is like dragging on the ground. So John is literally getting more than he, well, I'd say everything he deserves, but you could also argue more than he deserves for breaking into this guy's house and holding him hostage and threatening his life. <laughs> he gets a lot of shit handed to him. He gets drugged twice because he also gets drugged again at midnight with another martini. Except this time willingly, because um, Warwick joins a conga line, which is just Warwick and imaginary people behind him. And um, John is like, can I join the conga line? And Warwick's like, what? Because the, the, he hears noise, because it's like a loud party, and John's like, can I join the conga line? <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, well, sure. And then he drugs him again and 
puts John in front of him and he's carrying John and using his feet to like walk with John's feet and then like John falls over. <laughs> And Warwick falls on top of John, and then he's kind of like going like this as if the rest of the people behind him are far falling on top of him. And there's nobody there, so he's just like convulsing <laughs> as if people is like, oh, everybody. And uh, like, it's so funny to see because it just never lets up. It's always hilarity after hilarity. But going back to the Super 8 film, the Super 8 film is of Warwick. Like, it's black and white, and it's kind of a horror movie. Some kind of artistic piece that he has in his, like, psychotic head. And it's him just cutting his chest. Like, his stomach, his chest, his shoulders. And he's, like, smiling and, like, rubbing his hands on his face. Like, one of those, like, artsy-fartsy horror movies you see in, like, art festivals and art galleries that make no sense, but just loop a certain scene that is really fucked up, usually. It's that with Warwick and he's bouncing he's like I did all the makeup myself um psychotic at its best I love it um I love the scene where John is drugged again this is after midnight and he puts him in the pool on one of those floaties and John is literally he just has his head above water so he can breathe and he can't talk he just he's just mumbling and trying to put words together but he can't because he's so high and the neighbor catches him in the pool and is like really concerned so she is sipping her midnight coffee or whatever her late night coffee or tea or whatever it is and comes over to investigate and for whatever reason Warwick has a little closet filled with um classic monster masks like he's got I think Dracula and Frankenstein in there he definitely has Creature from the Black Lagoon which he grabs the mask of Creature from the Black Lagoon and quickly puts it over uh John's face as he's like behind a wall and he's still mumbling he's like oh and then he tells the neighbor that they were having a costume party and they just got back and that he's absolutely shit kit, shit faced and that he can't speak and he's ready to go to bed and then he's trying to convince the neighbor that John's okay and everything and and he's just getting ready to put him back to bed and John's moaning trying to like take the mask off and get the neighbor's attention but he's just like playing along he puts his hand down he's like Oh, it was just a costume party, man. We're all fine. And um, then he starts to have the imaginary friends, like, turn against... Not turn against him, but kind of fuck with his head. He's like, what if she calls the cops now? What are you going to do, uh, Warwick? Don't you know that, you know, you can get in shit? What happens if your uh, house gets raided? Like, they're all, like, all his voices in his head are, like, scrambling with him. And he's just like, shut up to everybody. And, um... There's a scene where he takes a fire pick and basically scorches the shit out of it and then scorches uh, John's foot. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. And then they uh, John comes up with the good idea of having a chess game because Warwick loves chess and John is actually really good at chess even though you wouldn't expect him to be. And Warwick has no idea. So he basically has a deal with Warwick that if he wins, he gets his freedom. But if... Warwick wins, then Warwick can have his life. Um, John ends up winning, and Warwick lets him go. <laughs> um, and he's like, uh, I may be many things, John, but one thing I am not is a liar. And then he lets him go. And then he starts messing with his head, too. He's like, you're such a little man, John, aren't you? You just let me take full advantage of you for the entire night, and you didn't do anything about it. You didn't even fight back, and I just... I took advantage of it, and I had the opportunity to, and I did. I took full advantage of your puny pussy little ass or whatever. And then he uh, gets pissed, and he takes one of those knives off the rack that I was talking about and stabs Warwick right in the stomach, except it's a fake knife. It's one of those retractable ones, so Warwick is all like, whoops, <laughs> nothing there. And um, basically, there's a point where he... I forget... I think, yeah, he just knocks him out and then he basically puts, for whatever reason, fake, um, like a fake throat slash and a fake, uh, like prosthetics all over his face as if he's beaten, but they're fake. Um, so whatever reason he does that, I don't know what, why Warwick does what he does, but he, then he, he puts this fake, like, beaten up face on John and then he just throws him outside in the trash and it's the next day. And um, Warwick gets up, he starts to peel all the shit off of his face. And uh, 
And then, like I said, in the last 20 minutes, it kind of turns into a detective story because Warwick is a functioning uh, law enforcement officer. So he's basically a cop. And on his spare time, he likes to have parties with his delusional friends. But in the mornings, he downs pills with some scotch and he goes to work and he's a functioning uh severely mentally ill man i guess but he he has a job and he you know he 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 basically pops pills every day to drown the voices i guess and uh, he's investigating this guy john with the robbery and john's uh girlfriend simone is an accomplice and they were working together and it turns into that story um throughout the film this is part of the the this is part of the film that I didn't really like too much. Um, there's flashbacks with what happened with John. And I don't like how they um, try to make the audience sympathize with John. They, they, there's a plot point where the reason why John robbed a bank, it's revealed slowly, is because he wanted to get a bunch of money to pay for medical treatment for his girlfriend because his girlfriend had a problem with one of her organs or something like that or something inside her was failing and causing her tremendous pain and she couldn't afford the medication so he wanted to rob this bank to get her the medication. It turns out they were working together because she worked at a bank anyway so they came up with this scheme where she or he sorry pretend pretended to ask her out or something like that a few times even though they were already going out and therefore that she would be able to like transfer the money secretly or something like that and then it turns out that she double crossed him and she purposely had him get caught so she could have all the money for herself and then it turns out that she actually wasn't sick and there was nothing wrong with her organs and she was lying the whole time because she wanted to con him and it just gets a little ridiculous when it comes to a story about a psychopath um polite mannered awesome character like warwick and that's uh john by the way and uh who actually i i consider him <laughs> he kind of looks like um Joaquin Phoenix slightly so I consider him a poor man's Joaquin Phoenix throughout the film because he has like his expressions not his voice too much but his expression sometimes is like a younger version of Joaquin Phoenix like the signs days kind of thing like he could be a little brother or something but uh regardless it turns into that and with a with a film like with such a simple but effective plot like the perfect host and then it just gets too complicated for its own good and a little too dramatic for its own good and a character like uh john taylor i don't want to have sympathy for because he's already just gone so far with the villain side of him and then you get him basically getting his own getting what he deserves by this crazy dude and the crazy dude's performance is so great that him becoming just a functioning guy in, you know, in the real world and everything. And there's a scene uh, involving a car garage where there's the interrogation between Simone, John's girlfriend, and John. Um, where he confronts her because he found out what she was doing and she was about to escape without him. And then she's doing the whole sympathy card like baby i'm so sorry i was looking all over for you i didn't know what happened to you i heard the cops were after you and oh my gosh and she's acting all innocent when you know she's not she's a complete bitch um and then for whatever reason uh warwick has john at gunpoint right before he's about to escape in his own car and they already catch simone and john has this like kind of interrogation with him but then he gives him the keys and gives him a bunch of money that he stole which it was in the trunk of the car and warwick takes a shit ton for himself and gives him a little bit to cross the border and is like okay fuck off we'll just keep this between us see you later goodbye and then the movie ends pretty pretty interesting uh one of the detectives in the police station gets a letter a few months later this is like two months later or something like that from john and this letter has a um polaroid picture because Warwick loves Polaroid cameras. Through the entire party, he's taking pictures with a Polaroid camera. He's taking pictures of everybody. And that scrapbook that I mentioned, he takes a Polaroid picture of John and puts John's picture in there while, like, creating this whole scrapbook of murders kind of thing. So he takes Polaroid pictures all the time. And John mails the detective one and says, watch out on the Polaroid picture. And it's a Polaroid picture of 
Warwick and John at Warwick's house. So the detective takes note on this and can't really let this go. So he confronts Warwick and Warwick is all like, you know, technology is getting really out of control these days. You know, in just like 10 minutes, you know how many, you know, and just a little bit of technology, what people can pull off creating these fake Polaroids. And he's like, that's a Polaroid. That's like a, that's not Photoshopped. You can't Photoshop a Polaroid. And he wants to investigate into it. And he's, you know, Warwick is all in defensive mode, but like really intelligent because psychopaths are always really, really smart. And he's so calm about it and he's uh, convincing and everything he's telling the detective sounds so believable. And I just love his dialogue and I love how the character was written and I love how he, I love his performance on the character. It's so, so good. Um... And, and and it was a it was an interesting finale and I love kind of the cliffhanger on it where then Warwick invites the detective for dinner and he's like, you know, I'm being civil, detective. I don't have to be. I'm trying to maintain our friendship. And then he, he tries to invite him for dinner because the detective already wants to go to Warwick's house to investigate the house because he recognizes the couch that Warwick and John are on in that Polaroid picture. So he wants to investigate the whole house, but Warwick tries to be nice and save face. And is like, well, just come for dinner and you can investigate. And then it'll just be, you know, you and I, I'm already having guests come tonight anyway, so you can join or whatever. So not you and I, but uh, he can join the guests, the guests, the, the invisible ones. <laughs> and uh, And then you see the whole setup where this is going and he's like, you drink red or white <laughs> as a like final line. Um, so yeah, it kind of sets up for what you know is going to happen after that. Really, really funny fucking movie, man. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't pull too many punches other than that, that kind of not far fetched, but uh, overcrowded ending. That's a good way to put it. The, the, the 20, the last 20 minutes are a little bit overcrowded. Um, in comparison to like what the first hour and 10 minutes was. And um, I mean, it's, it's entertaining as hell. Um, and like I said, the, the best reason to watch this film is just for his performance alone. Any Frasier fans have to see this film. Um, I mean, if, if anybody loved Frasier growing up for, with Frasier and is very familiar with the, I think his name was Neil, if I'm not mistaken, in Frasier. Um, you know, you just have to see his, the change in his performance in in this uh, in this movie. He's so funny in like a, a sadistic way, and uh, and yeah, it's it's super entertaining. The party is the best part of the movie, the imaginary party where it's just him and John. But <laughs> there's like thirty other people there, and they're dancing, and he's like, there's like he does this like stupid dance on the table where he's like. And just his facial expressions, it's its a treat. This film's a treat. I highly recommend uh, The Perfect Host. Two and a half out of five for me, just because of the unbalance and uh, the uh, the unevenness of the, of the plot from beginning to end, I would say. Um, but other than that, the good moments are great and the movie holds up. Like, it's almost a three. It, it, it's, it's a very, very high two and a half. So like I'd probably say uh, probably 54 out of 100 or like a really, really low three, like 56. Um, really, really good stuff. I highly recommend The Perfect Toast. This is 2010. It premiered at Sundance and uh, go find it somewhere if you could find it streaming as well. Uh, check this out and uh, it's not one to be missed, especially if you like independent cinema. So subscribe to Morgan Film Fan if you like to listen to my voice or if you like my film reviews. Uh, check out what's on the channel. Uh, subscribe if you're interested. And until next review, stay tuned. Until then, have a good one and cheers.